This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. It was the summer of 1959 and hotter than hell. Compared to the dry, crisp air of Colorado, the Washington humidity was smothering, and from the moment I stepped off the airplane at National Airport, I was in a constant state of sticky perspiration. The Treasury Department had negotiated cheap rates for agents to stay at a boarding house about two blocks from the White House, run by a woman everyone called Ma Bauma. While Ma kept the rooms clean, it was no frills, and there was no air conditioning. But all I could think about was that I was being given the chance of a lifetime. I had been instructed to report to the northwest gate of the White House and present my credentials. Good morning, I said as I handed the uniformed guard my blue leather commission book, trying to sound as if walking up to the White House and expecting to be let in was perfectly natural. A wave of apprehension washed over me as he scrutinized the photo, looked at me, looked back at the photo, and then began flipping through some papers. Finally, he handed my commission book back to me and said, Good morning, Agent Hill. You can go in through the West Wing door. Mr. Rowley is expecting you. As I entered the White House for the first time, my anxieties dissipated, and all I could feel was an overwhelming sense of pride. Portraits of past presidents lined the walls, gazing down on the people who were bustling around with urgency and purpose, seemingly oblivious to the history surrounding them. As I was escorted to Mr. Rowley's office, I tried to take it all in, making mental observations of every detail so the next time I saw my mother, I could tell her what it was like to be inside the White House. Fifty-year-old James J. Rowley was the special agent in charge of the White House detail and, having been in the position since Franklin D. Roosevelt was president, was highly respected by all the agents. Rowley's office, which he shared with his administrative assistant, Walter Blaschek, was just inside the West Wing lobby. Crammed into the small, windowless office, were two desks facing each other in the middle of the room, while a couple of metal filing cabinets and a well-worn couch were squeezed against one wall. Standing ominously on the opposite wall was a large gun case stacked with forty-five caliber Thompson submachine guns, twelve-gauge shotguns, and thirty caliber carbines. Mr. Rowley stood up from his desk as I entered the office and greeted me warmly with a smile and a firm handshake. Welcome to the White House, Clint, he said. I understand you've been doing good work out there in Denver. Thank you, sir, I said. It's an honor to meet you. Mr. Rowley had an affable personality, with an easy smile belied by steely eyes that could size you up in an instant, without revealing what he was thinking. The son of Irish Catholic immigrants, he had a toughness that came from being raised in the Bronx during the Depression, and having to support his family after his father was killed in a job-related accident with the City of New York Highway Department. There was a no-nonsense air about him, and I liked him immediately. Mr. Rowley explained that I would be assigned to a shift, and over the course of the next thirty days, I would always be with an agent on that shift to witness firsthand how the detail operated. He handed me a black notebook that had metal pens holding it together so pages could easily be added or removed and said, here's the White House detail manual. This should answer a lot of your questions, but certainly don't hesitate to ask anyone if there's anything you don't understand. We have no room for error or miscommunication. Printed in silver on the cover of the manual was a Secret Service star, and beneath it, White House detail. In the lower right-hand corner was the number nine. Mr. Rowley explained, that there were a set number of copies of the manual, and each one was assigned to a specific agent. Inside was detailed information about the automobiles and aircraft we used, people to be notified when the president left the White House, the protocol for arrivals and departures both domestically and internationally, the formation of motorcades for various situations, and a litany of other details that only the agents protecting the president were to know. Under no circumstances was the manual to be shared with anyone outside the detail. By the time I left his office, the enormity of the responsibility I was about to undertake had begun to set in, and I hoped I could prove to be worthy of the trust being placed in me. Every one of the next thirty days was exhilarating and exhausting.